So without much ado, let's start this conversation. I thought we could uh, start with something which is on, you know, on top of everybody's mind about the pandemic and how did HUL itself, you know, pivot to become more digital, get more online, what are the challenges? And uh, uh, so how did you tackle the pandemic? That's the top of everybody's mind. Okay. You know, it was very interesting, Vinay, because we set up a crisis team even before WH declared it as a pandemic. But we set up a crisis team not anticipating that the pandemic will spread to India, but we set right. up a crisis team to manage the disruptions that will come in because we were importing certain chemicals from China. Yeah, with the benefit of hindsight, is had we anticipated, we could have uh, got a, uh, a benefit of a few weeks to prepare ourselves. But we went in for lockdown a week before the government announced the lockdown. Uh, we went in for work from home before the government announced the lockdown. Okay. And uh, then the first thing we did was to focus on as the thing started as we became visible that it's going to be a big issue and the lockdowns happen, then we decided that we needed to focus on a uh, few key priorities, yeah, because it wasn't business as usual. And what we then decided that we focus on five big areas. One is, of course, the safety of our people. That's paramount that comes first. The second one was ensuring how do we keep the supply lines running? The third one was, how do we keep our fingers on the pulse of consumer behavior and the changing demand pattern? The fourth one was, despite the fact that we are a zero debt company, how do we focus on cash and cost? And the fifth one was, how do we help the community during the time of the crisis? So if you were to ask me, this were our North Stars. Yeah, and this is what we focused on. So there were many things which we would normally do. We shed them or kept them by the wayside, and we said, this is what we are going to focus on. Right. And uh, over the last 18 months, we have also built new muscles. And, uh, you know, today, if I look at it from a lens of safety of our people, we have 60 full-time doctors. We have about 45 state-of-the-art ambulances. We, during the second wave, we had set up about 30 isolation centers. Right. And uh, when we saw that uh, oxygen, medical oxygen, would become a big issue in the country, which was in April of this year. We airlifted 5,500 A few hundred were kept for our own ecosystem. But the majority of them were deployed in about 10 cities on, uh, you could borrow, use, and return basis free of cost to the people, the apartment with Portia. Right. So that was this focus. Then the focus shifted to vaccination as vaccination became available. And what we decided is we have not only to vaccinate our own people, their families, but also people who work in outer core with our distributors, with our 2P, 3P suppliers, and also uh, over a lack Shakti amounts that we have for micro entrepreneurs in India. So we right. took upon us the responsibility of vaccinating 300,000 people. And uh, we're pleased with the progress that has happened. If I look at my inner core, unless you have reasons to not get vaccinated, say for instance, you were infected and you're waiting for a certain period to get over, all our people have now got at least one vaccination. And I think by end of September, a large section of our people would have got the second dose as well. And I believe that either as a nation 
or is a corporation. There is no investment today which gets better return than vaccination. So it's extremely important that uh, we take all possible steps to get vaccinated as quickly as possible. Sure. So what did it do to hedge you in the marketplace in terms of, you know, forcing you to go more digital? Was there a was there a digital pivot? What happened in the you know, market? Thankfully, thankfully, what happened was that we had started working uh, with on reimagining HUL about five years back. And this was all about bringing data technology center stage. And what this has done, the pandemic, has accelerated the journey. Let me give you an uh, example. You know, we were always have been for the last four or five years, we've been working on how do we help the humble grocer digitize and bring in more technology. So we had started working on Shekhar app where a retailer can place an order even when a salesman is not able to visit them or when the salesman beat doesn't come and the stock gets over. Yeah, that was the philosophy how we started developing a Shekhar app. Pre-pandemic, it used to take us a lot of effort to convince the retailer to adopt the digital app. Yeah. Post-pandemic, or after the beginning of the pandemic, certainly this is accelerated. And today I would believe it is one of the most widely adopted with more than half a million outlets adopting that. And uh, say pre-pandemic, we were getting the total demand capture digitally, which was about 3% of our turnover. Now it has reached about 10% of our turnover. Okay. So for what, for us, reimagine HUL is not just about e-commerce, or it is not just about digital marketing. It is looking at the whole value chain and asking ourselves that how can data technology help us become more effective and more efficient? And instead of a linear value chain, we are now creating ecosystems of consumers, customers, and operations with data and technology center stage. Now this has, over the last few years, what it has brought forth, a culture of experimentation. We have hundreds of experiments running in the company today. And uh, these experiments, when we started Reimagine HUL, we started with that we brought in people who loved the business and with, they were data and technology savvy. And many of the projects came with their ideas. It was not kind of pushed down. Okay. It came bottom up. So we had scores of experiments running and uh, because I wanted to remove the bottlenecks in the system, so I used to chair the digital reimagine HUL agenda. And uh, slowly it gained momentum. Then we were able to put, join the dots. Now our chief data officer is a part of my top leadership table. And uh, you know, it's interesting how, uh, if we step back a bit, in 2015, Vinay, we went to a concept called Winning in Many Indias. Winning in Many Indias uh, started by recognizing that India is not a homogeneous entity. Absolutely, yes. The language is different. The eating habits are different. The palate is different. The color, the, 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 the beauty quotient is different. Yeah. So when you have such a diverse India, 
you cannot have one strategy in the country. Yes. So we broke up India into 15 clusters, which were relatively homogeneous. Our strategy today is distinct for each cluster. Our execution today is distinct for each cluster. The strategy in Tamil Nadu will be very different from the strategy in UP or Bihar cluster. Yeah, because uh, uh, also the per capita consumption is different. Absolutely. The categories are in a different stage of evolution. The competitors are different. So what this did was this brought in a level of complexity. But I always treat it as a high density lipoprotein, the good cholesterol. OK. But just think of in it that earlier a brand manager or category had used to make one pan India strategy. Now we were asking him to make 15 strategies. Now this couldn't work unless you provided him with data, technology and analytics. So this was the reason behind reimagining it. Right. Yeah, but then we got in. Yeah, you know, we have we we are still the employer of choice in the country. We are able to attract the best possible talent. So the brains are there, and when you let them free, let them blossom, you bring out the best of creativity. And uh, so what now we do is, uh, I still chair the reimagine HUL, and uh, we have some of the best brains in the company working on different projects. And the projects come from bottom up, but now we have guardrails to see which direction we want to go and how is it helping us build the three ecosystems that I've spoken about. So what pandemic has done is accelerated our reimagine HUL journey. It's given it a further fillip, but I'm so pleased that we started working on this years before it, the pandemic happened. So you're quite prescient in that sense. In many ways, it was like I explained you the circumstances. Yeah, uh, it could be a bit of serendipity that we are where we are. But uh, yeah, we have been in the country now, Vinay, for 80 years. And then there are not many companies who can very proudly say that for 80 years we have been market leaders. And one of the reasons why we have been market leaders is that the company under successive CEOs has reinvented itself, reinvented itself with the changing times. Yeah, what Mr. Prakash Tandon did was started the ization of management, Indianization of management. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Dr. Ganguly or Mr. Thomas, those were the days when India was still working under the license law. Um, he was able to convince the government and we then went into diverse areas, into fertilizers, into exports in a very big way so that we could retain the majority for an ownership. But it also stemmed from and it sowed the seeds of philosophy that what is good for India is good for Hindustan. Good yeah, Dr. Ganguly then took technology to the new level. Then on the Keki Dabi Sates era, we had some big acquisitions. So successive CEOs have been reinventing the company. And I think our reimagining HUL agenda is part of that journey. That how do you ensure you remain relevant to the context? How do you ensure that you change with the times? And uh, also coming from an understanding if the change outside is happening at a pace faster than the change inside, then we are in a bit of a problem. So we don't want to be forced to change, but we would like lead the change. And uh, after we have created a vision on Reimagine HUL, Vinay. We want to be the most intelligent consumer goods enterprise. And uh, that's the journey we are on. Right. We have made progress, but this is not a destination. 
because technology will keep changing. Changing, yeah. Just you look at the speed of computing and with the cloud com coming in, the storage of data has virtually become a non-issue. Yeah, the artificial neural networks that have come in, the MI, uh, the machine learning AI that has come in, this is making a dramatic difference. And we will have machine intelligence complement human intelligence increasingly. And that is what we are aiming to achieve in the business. Right. Do you have a supplementary uh, question? Yeah, uh, lots of questions actually. Uh, yeah, because uh, yeah, Sanjeev, a couple of questions to begin with. Uh, one, uh, you know, uh, you said you you sort of laid the foundation of this re with this reimagine uh, HUL strategy, but I'm sure even uh, you know you wouldn't have uh, you know sort of foreseen something like the pandemic, uh, you know, coming and disrupting business in any way, right? So, uh, do you think? And and you said that you know uh, a lot of things which you wanted to do has been. Uh, the pace has picked up because especially technology adoption. Uh, but I'm sure this there were a lot of challenges in, as you mentioned, there were stakeholders, you know, the health related issues, how to uh, several. So would you say that in your in your, uh, in your in your career in with HUL, would this have been the sort of the most challenging or most difficult phase? Uh, let, yeah, let, let me explain. That's a very good question, Thomas. If you look at my career, before working for Unilever, now I'll be completing 20 years with Unilever in another, another two months. Uh, two months to the date, 27th October 92 is when I joined. And, uh, within a year of my joining Union Carbide, it was a baptism of fire by me when I was plucked out and sent to Bhopal as to be part of the crisis team. Right. So I saw. It is still perhaps if you leave aside Chernobyl or you leave aside uh, uh, the Long Mile Island accident in the US, this would still be one of the biggest disasters. Right. So, saw the crisis at very close quarters. I was perhaps the junior most member of the crisis team. Right. Yeah. But it was. While the tragedy was of huge proportion, because a lot of lives had been lost, but as an experience, it was an experience of a lifetime. Yeah, is seeing at close quarters the responsibilities of a corporation, how you react to a crisis, how you lead the team during a crisis, how do you engage with the communities during the crisis. So a lot of things got instilled in me during those days. When I was chairman of Unilever Bangladesh, that was during the time of the second Gulf War. And there was a lot of an antagonism against Western companies. Right. Yeah, because there was a feeling that the war was unjust, unfair. And uh, we were the lightning rod as being one of the largest multinational Western companies in the Bangladesh. So one had to steer that. Then when I became chairman of North Africa, Middle East, it was the Arab Spring. Right. Two years into my role, I had to face Arab Spring and I still remember it started all from Tunisia. Remember the Tunisia, yes. in Tunis? Bender set himself on fire. That's right. And it engulfed the entire region. And it spread from uh, Tunisia to Libya to Algeria to Egypt. Then it went, uh, it even uh, moved to Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and my whole region was up in flames. And so I had to battle that crisis. And uh, just to give you that, uh, because to an extent I was battle hardened over the right. years, dealing right. with several crises. That was a period we had a big business in Egypt. And Egypt was a telling example because what had happened is uh, before the Muslim Brotherhood took over and before Mubarak was uh, overthrown, that was a period of complete anarchy in the country. Right. Um, even the police had vacated the barracks. 
There was nothing over there. Yeah, there was no banks were open, no ATMs were open, no cash was there. During that, and we had pretty big operations in Egypt. During that period, when many of the global companies used to attribute crisis in Middle East to the soft results, we grew double digit in Egypt. Mm. We did many things which were counterintuitive. But at the core of it was looking after our people. Right. Now, what we did to this is we went to our wholesalers and we asked them that how much cash can you spare? They were very happy to lend it to Unilever, to give it to Unilever because they were worried about the safety of the cash. We made small packets and our people went and distributed cash, not just to our own people, but also to people who worked for our distributors, our loaders and loaders, salesmen and everyone. We went to big warehouses, collected as much food as we could and brought it to our factories. Whoever was running out of food, they could come to the factory and collect the food. Who? It wasn't the police who was protecting our factory. The factories were being burned down. It was our own workers working on their own, three shifts a day, protecting the factory, which was the first factory to start operations. We were the first factory to start up. I'll give you a very interesting incident. In, when I was running the region, I was based out of Dubai, but I had four managing directors. One of them was based in Cairo, Alexandria, and he was looking after my Mushrik region, yeah, which okay. was Egypt, Levan, Iraq, Sudan, that part. A wonderful guy called Khalid Fayed. And uh, during the height of this crisis, I asked Khalid, Khalid, I want you to build a revised business plan. So first he thought I was joking and he laughed it out. What revision? We don't even know whether you know, a factory will remain or not. I said, no, don't worry about that. Go and make an aggressive business plan. He came and presented me a plan which required additional investment of about a million euros. I said, no, I'm not looking at tweaking around the edges. I want you to make a seriously aggressive plan. And I said, Khalid, I'm not joking. You make that plan. We will execute it. If we win, the credit is yours. If the money goes waste, the responsibility is mine. Let's right. do it. When others were stopping advertising, we were all over the television. When right. others were reducing distribution, we were increasing distribution. Just think of it, during those days, the only thing people were doing was sitting on front of the television, nothing else. Right, right. And what were they watching? Only Junilever ads. <laughs> yeah. right. So during that period, we grew double digit during the height of the crisis. Right. Yeah. So in many ways, I would say, Thomas, that Unilever, look at my journey. I was chairman in Bangladesh, mm. yeah, which was a business that time less than half a billion euros. Then I became chairman of Philippines, which was a billion euros. Then I became chairman of North Africa, Middle East, which was 20 countries from Oman in the east to Morocco in the west. and. Uh, much bigger than a billion euro. So Unilever has been training me and getting me ready for bigger jobs. Right. So I think one thing which, if uh, immodestly I have to say, if a crisis hits me, it doesn't phase me. Right. Now this is a crisis which is very different. Because this was a health crisis. This was an economic crisis. This was a societal crisis, all rolled into one. All rolled into one, yeah. True. True. So it was a very different dimension. But I think the philosophy, Thomas, that look after the people and people will look after the business. Right, right. It held true 
in during the Arab Spring for me. It held true now. I'll give you a very interesting example. During the first lockdown, we were all safely ensconced in our homes. Right. Uh, but the nation needed soaps and sanitizers. Our factories were running. And I've been doing several virtual visits to factories. So in the last three, four months, I would have visited 25 of my factories. Okay. And I was speaking to a worker. And I asked him, Aapko dar nahi lagta. Mm. Factory mein aate ho. So he had some very nice things to tell me. Yeah, and here, you know, he is not someone who is uh, uh, using a management jargon. Right. Yeah. He said, he, mere ghar walon ko dar lagta hai jana. And he said, ki jo hamare safety hai company mein, ye mere ghar se bhi mujhe factory mein jada safe hai. And then his telling remark was, ki sab main to sabun banata hu, isse desh ki suraksha ho bhi. Just think of it. Yeah. A humble person, factory worker, you know, telling you that he makes soaps to help save the nation. That's right. purpose in life. Right. That's what makes you walk that extra mile. Right. And I think that's the kind of spirit we have embedded in our people. I, I'll give you another example. Uh, during the second wave, which was brutal for the nation, yes. and uh, doctors were under severe stress. Mm. Yeah, even though we have 60 doctors, but it was all about organizing uh, first is monitoring the health, then whoever fell infected. Uh, depending on the serious and moving them to hospital, hospital beds were not easily available, then medicines, organized. So they were under severe stress. So then we decided we need to supplement them. So we asked for volunteers. We had over 100 volunteers who we call them as nightingales. They worked 24 hours a day to help supplement their efforts of the doctor. And we were not looking just after our people. We were looking after the people, their families, the outer core, and also many neighbors. Whoever needed help. I have heard stories about people saying we were up the whole night finding a bed for our people in hospital. I know of a person who drove 400 kilometers to take an oxygen concentrator for his colleague. You know, that's the kind of spirit you bring in if you are a purpose-led company and uh, people realize that, uh, you know, you have to step up and you have to help the nation, help the community and do your best. So in many ways, while the times were tough, we also saw the best of HUR. Right. right. You know, when you, when you, when you came in in 2013 uh, and since we are sort of looking back, uh, yeah. Uh, to your career and how your experiences came about. Uh, you know, so one of the things when you came, or a couple of things that uh, when you came in, people were saying was that, you know, Sanjeev is not a typical HUL uh, uh, leader. I mean, you're not, you know, you're not in the India market. You, you're not a typical marketing guy, you know, you, you know, so did yeah. you have to do something different or? Uh, so, see, first is those people who were, who made those statements did not know me. Right. Right. Now, as a CEO, I think one important bit is you need to be a good businessman. You need to have a very good understanding of different levers of business, different functions of business. In my career, though I'm a chartered accountant by training, I've worked in sales, I've worked in finance, in, I've worked in marketing, I've worked in supply chain, I worked in mergers and acquisition. So I have worked in different domains besides my core skills of accounting and finance. Right. And before I came into India, I had already been a chairman of different Unilever companies for 11 years. Right. So in many ways, I had been trained by Unilever 
to come and head Unilever's crown jewel. Yeah. And uh, the other important bit is my first format, yeah, I'm a complete Indian at heart. And my first formative years were in India. And even when I was out of the country for 21 years, I always read about India, was completely glued on. Yeah, read the newspapers, read the magazines, read what was happening. And every vacation, yeah, despite when if, even if we were traveling to Europe or America, we would make it a point to come and spend at least a week in India so that our daughters could spend time in India, get to know the country, get to know their grandparents. So we have the fact that we were out of the country. I was not like a typical NRI. I right. was completely clued on to what was happening in India. Right. So just to backtrack a little in your in your life and your career, you uh, how did you end up taking up finance and where where did you grow up, uh, Sanjeev? Oh, oh, you know, just to give you a background, Vinay, quintessential Indian middle class. My parents grew up in uh, part of Punjab, which is now in Pakistan, in Lahore and Gujramala. So they were migrants. Okay. And, you know, the life of a migrant is very tough when you lost your life. So they were one of those families who had lost nearly everything. And uh, my dad, at a very young age, he started working while he was still studying. He used to go to his college at six in the morning, study, then he had joined Reserve Bank. And in then Delhi? He, he started in Kanpur, okay. where they had moved after partition. But then very shortly, he moved to Bombay. So most of his life, he was in Bombay and he went up to a very senior position. So we grew up. I was born in Kanpur because my maternal parents, the grandparents were there. So my mother had gone there for delivery. But I grew up in Mumbai. Okay. So that's what it was. A classical middle class boy from Mumbai who loves playing cricket. Yeah. And grew up in a typical middle class family where the values of hard work, integrity, yeah, is education, learning. Those were ingrained in us very early in life. And those have held us in good stead. And I think to a large extent, Vinay, I, we were influenced by that. The best moment in our, as childhood, our best moment in our day was dinner time, which was compulsory, all of us having dinner together. How many siblings were you? And our dad would regale us with stories about Rizabad. How many but, siblings were you? Oh, uh, an elder brother and a younger sister. OK. Yeah, so dinner time was sacrosanct. And a dad would talk about the economy, about banking, about finance. And I think that's where the seed of becoming a finance person grew. And I remember I used to, I had changed schools. And I had, uh, uh, my school was, I had moved to Bhada New High School to play cricket. That was, at those days, the best school for cricket in Bombay. Yeah, is uh, we had uh, some Vijay Merchant and all from those schools, just to give you an idea. And uh, that was a school with amazing talent in cricket. And I realized very soon thereafter that, hey man, I don't have the kind of talent to make it big. And that was also a time when a school used to get done aptitude test for all students who were, as they went into grade nine, to help them understand what they should do. And it was very clear that I was bloody good in math, very good in numbers, and I would be very good in finance. So while the seeds were there, I think it got cemented after my aptitude test. So right. I was very clear that I'm going to do chartered accountancy. And I would also come to know that the exams are tough. So it was a kind of a challenge for me. If it's a tough exam, I have to crack it. 
And that's how my journey started. And you know how the paths would lead you. My love for cricket, I did my article ship under Mr. NKP Salve. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. And uh, then uh, I was amongst the toppers in the country in CA. So I had a lot of companies, you know, approaching you. And I had then also zeroed in on two companies. And that time they were of equal size. One was the Unilever group of companies and the other was Union Carbide. Unilever group of companies was not one entity then. It was Hindustan Lever, there was Ponds India, Ponds. there was Lipton, Lipton, there was Brook Bond, and there were different entities. But there was a common recruitment process. So the Unilever group of companies offered me a job with Lipton in Kolkata. Union Carbide offered me a job in Mumbai. They were headquartered in Mumbai. So for a Mumbai lad, it didn't take much to wear towards Union Carbide. But again, serendipity. A few years later, I joined Unilever outside India. And that's how my journey started. I was destined to work for companies with big U. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, God has been kind. It's been a fabulous journey. And many times, you know, youngsters ask me, if you were to be given your years back, what would you do? I would do exactly what I did. No regrets whatsoever. But how was it being married to a CA as well? I mean, do you now have that's a... also very interesting. You know, Mona is a chartered accountant by training. And uh, thankfully, she was a corporate banker and uh, not in a consumer goods company. <laughs> so, yeah, is uh, while we have our educational background is similar, I think we are uh, pretty diverse individuals, but with a similar set of values. And our daughters are not following our footsteps. <laughs> we have twin daughters, Vinay, Naina and Rajni. So Naina, she did her engineering at MIT, and now she's at Harvard Business School. And Roshni, she did her undergrad at Cornell in economics and anthro. And now she's doing her dual masters at Harvard Kennedy and MIT Sloan. So they have not chartered accountants. Yeah, and they want to be entrepreneurs. So again, right. very different from us. So was it tough bringing up twins? Yes, initially we were in Dubai. And uh, I, I have to tell you this, you know, we were to go for sonography and uh, Mona and I went and there was this Al Zara hospital in Dubai where the sonography was done. And there was this English nurse who came out running, took my hand and took me inside and showed me the screen and pointed to two blips and said, you're going to be a father of twins. We were just getting used to another life coming into our lives. Yeah. So we left Alzara. We went out for lunch. We finished our lunch. I dropped Mona back to office. We would have, from the time the nurse told us, and by the time I dropped her, we would have spent two hours and we had not spoken a word. <laughs> yeah, we were just getting used to how will we manage twins? But, uh, you, you, you know, it's been a great journey. The first one year is tough because it is not one plus one, it is a multiplier impact. One baby would sleep, the other would get up. The other would sleep, other would get up. Right. So, yeah, it's a, it was very tough and we didn't have our mothers with us. But thankfully, we got some very good help. And after the one year, then uh, it became lovely. You, you know, it's a very special bond the twins have, which is very exceptional. And uh, People ask me, how is this bond different? And I'll just give you one very 
example which is embedded in my head. Yeah, this was when our daughters were in grade nine. And Roshni was asked to write an essay at school on something unique about herself. And she had written an essay about being a twin. And there was one, two lines which were so profound. Roshni had written, I get upset when my twin sister does better in class than me. But I get more upset when I get more marks than her. Uh -huh. That's a paradox. Yeah. <laughs> but that is what being a twin is. Competitive, but then they really look out for each other. Do they look alike? They are, see, they are identical twins from a medical sense, but, and also a, a, they grew up in a similar family. So for many strangers, they would look very similar, but for us, you know, there are very clear differences. When our girls were to go to college, Vinay, they decided to split up the IB League amongst themselves. I'll apply to this set of colleges, you apply to this set of colleges, because they didn't want to go in the same college. They were very clear they wanted to establish their own identity. And I think it has been the right thing. When they were in school, they were often referred to as the Meta Twins. Mm, okay. Yeah, but now they have their own set of, they also have a lot many common friends. Right now, again, you know, uh, fate has brought them together in Boston. They're both in Boston. But across the river, MIT is on one side of the river, Harvard Business School is on the other. But, uh, you know, they have their own set of friends. They are still very close to each other. They are also their common friends. So it's been wonderful bringing up twins. And I, when I personally believe that parenting is one of the most wonderful experiences that life offers you. Absolutely. Yes, indeed. Yeah. So, Thomas? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Sanjeev, uh, just want to do, uh, you know, uh, get your thoughts on, you know, so HUL has recently uh, hit six trillion market cap. Uh, so when you came in, it's about was about seventeen billion dollars. So do you think this growth has been much beyond your expectations from, or do you think this is what you had charted out uh, when you started off? You know, I would be absolutely wrong if I were to tell you that I had envisaged we will take the market cap from $17 billion to $83 billion in eight years. Right. Yeah, that wasn't. But I come from a philosophy that if you do the right things, yeah, then the valuation happens. You can't be starting with the premise that, man, I'm going to chase valuation. Right. I think what we need to do is is creating value, valuation will follow. Right. If you look at our 10 years journey, uh, we have added about 25,000 crores as a delta turnover. Right. And this 25,000 crores is more than the total turnover of any other FMCG company in the country. Right. right. Our profit margins the EBITDA used to be at the beginning of the millennium, even when I came in, in the vicinity of 13, 14%. Yeah, now it's in the vicinity of 25%. And the third axis of a value creation model is a capital velocity, a return on capital employee. Right, right. Which has been, there is no company in the top 20 most valuable company in the country where the return on capital employed is even close to what we do. So growth, margin, and capital velocity, that has been the mantra of creating value. And as Unilever, we always play the long-term game. Right. Yeah, if there is a great quarter, we are not exuberant. And uh, if there is not so great quarter, we don't get into depression. Right. And I would never do things with an eye of giving a boost to the stock price. No, we will do things which are fundamentally right and good for the long term health of the business. And that has what has driven us 
to do the right things, which has resulted in very good returns for the shareholders. Right. But my obsession is not with the stock market. Yeah, my obsession is with consumers. How can I create value for them? How can I delight them? Right. Yeah, how can we uh, be a better version of ourselves? That's what makes us drive. And when you get up in the morning, that's what gives you energy. I think the stock valuation is a result of what we do. Fair enough. So, uh, yeah, 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 Vinay, go ahead. So, Mr. Sanjeev, you see that uh, uh, during this past two years, consumers and consumerism has changed dramatically. Perhaps uh, uh, see, may not change again. No, there is some very good question, Vinay. The way I would look at it is there are some behaviors which have been adopted at a faster scale, which are bound to stay. There are some behaviors which are transient in nature. Let me explain a bit. Say if you look at it from a lens of health and wellness, I think there is a growing consciousness today that uh, you have to look after your physical health, your emotional health, your mental well-being. And this is something which is bound to remain. Even the younger generation have become far more conscious about the mental health, about the physical health, and what you eat, what you do, hygiene, for instance. You know, it used to take us, we used to invest a huge amount of money in market development, in uh, taking the message of hand wash to villages across the country. Thanks to the pandemic, now people are adopting it, and I think this is about to stay. When you look at shopping habits, there are two things which have stood out. One is e-commerce. Yeah. The other is the renaissance of the humble grocer, the neighborhood store. Yes. Right. People have realized the benefit of proximity. And whenever the mobility has been curtailed, the modern trade has taken a beating. Because they are in big malls, big stores, people have not gone, stores have been shut, etc. But if you see between the first wave and the second wave, when things opened up, people again flocked back to the modern trade stores. Because in India, shopping for many people is an experience in itself. On a weekend, you take your children, dress up, go to the mall, you know, eat in uh, fast food, yeah. watch a movie, yeah. then do your shopping and come back and touch, feel the goods, etc. So it's a great experience. So this is this impact on modern trade is transient. I believe people will go back to modern trade. But health wellness will remain. Digitizing is not going to go back. Maybe the same pace of change may not be there. For example, e-commerce. But once people have tasted the benefit of assortment and the benefit of convenience, they're bound to stay with it. So there's going to, you know, in the uh, Thomas at the beginning of the pandemic, we had also seen two kinds of behavior. When it came to people who were not very well off, they increased the number of shopping trips and they went in more for lower unit price packs. Right. As far as the upper middle and rich people were concerned, they went in more for larger packs because they were worried about whether the stock would stock be available or not, pantry loading, etc. So they would stock up. These were two behaviors which were both at play at the same time. But during the second wave, because the factories did not shut, your neighborhood stores, they were open, albeit for two hours a day, but they were still open. There was no scrambling for pantry loading. So different behaviors have to be manifesting itself in many different ways. The other important bit which stands out Say before two years, whenever in an investor conference to investor analysts, we would talk about our sustainable living agenda. There would be not many questions asked of for us. You know, environment and sustainability, etc. In the last two years, the interest on ESG has gone up significantly. 
people want to know what are you doing on the social ground, on the governance, on the environment side. So words like biodegradable, net zero, all those which were a bit alien for the people have now becoming increasingly a common language. Even when you look at the governments, you know, it took a lot of effort to bring them to Paris. Yeah. And then after Paris, there were certain commitments made, including transfer of resources to developing countries, because they would have a period where the per capita greenhouse gas emissions will go up. Whereas the other developed countries have already had the big share of spewing more into the atmosphere. So all that really had slowed down. There was not much of, we didn't hear much about it. But as we are moving towards, say, COP26, it suddenly picked up space. The countries are making commitments on net zero. Yeah, the companies are very conscious about their environment footprints. And I think there is no going back now. This will certainly pick up pace because increasingly people have realized after the pandemic, you know, for pandemic, you have a vaccination. For climate increase, there won't be a vaccination. There's also a lot of money is now, uh, I mean, investments are coming into companies That's which are moving. Because yeah. now, say the companies have become conscious, right? right? If you look at the round table, the business round table in the US, who all this year lived by the Milton Friedman philosophy of business or business is business, they have now come back to recognizing that they need to play a bigger role in environment and in the social agenda. Right. So consequently, there is a lot of pressure on hedge funds, on invest big uh, venture capitalists that may need to put in money recognizing that this is an integral part of the agenda. And you mentioned right. about uh, experiments and, you know, you spoke about how uh, digital AI machine learning is uh, becoming core to some of what, what you're doing. Uh, could you share some of your uh, current experiment, moonshot ideas that you are uh, doing in, in what areas in terms of adopting these technologies? You know, it's, uh, I, I'll tell you something. The first thing we did uh, when we started the Vimy journey and when we started the uh, Reimagine HUL journey is create a live wire where disparate data can be brought together and you will be able to slice and dice it on your fingertips. So that was the start of the journey. Then we moved to creating some very powerful models which would enable us to optimize should we be playing the levers of price, trade investments, media investments to maximize value and maximize growth? Now, these are all machine learning led models. The more data you have, the better they become. Now we are moving to a stage where every investment we do, we are looking at the attribution to growth. Think of it like this also, Thomas, that uh, in India is a land of grocery stores. Yeah, right. We have about 10 million stores in the country. We reach millions of stores directly and many more millions indirectly. Now, a store in South Mumbai, a grocery store, and a store in Dhaisa, grocery store, should be having completely different assortment. Yeah. In the past, your algorithms were based on what you sold. Right. Now your algorithms are based on who are the consumers living in the vicinity of your store. Right. right. What would be the living standard measure? What are the categories they've adopted? So what should be the assortment? Right. So you would be able to customize the assortment in each of the millions of stores. That's what data and technology will allow you to do. Yeah. 
The other is look at it from a lens of personalization. Building cohorts. One would be able to do precision marketing at scale. Our digital factory, we are reconfiguring the entire supply chain. Oh, yeah. The number of factories, the multiple categories that we manufacture in the factories, the number of fulfillment centers and the location, depending right. on where the demand is. And most of these factories are now highly digitally enabled. There are digital right. twins of the factories. Right, right, right. And all the maintenance and all are based on predictive maintenance. Interesting. So the value chain, like I was describing, Thomas, which was linear in nature. Yeah. Plan, source, make, market, deliver is now becoming more circular and it is becoming increasingly ecosystem. Very interesting. So, is yeah. it uh, more just in time? It is increasingly it? becoming. You know, our vision would be that what you sell today, we manufacture tomorrow. So, the and one of the that's the vision. It will take some time for us to reach there, but we are progressing towards that. One more thing which we measure very closely, Vinay, is uh, days between runs. Yeah, earlier you would have longer runs because that's what brought in efficiency. Longer runs would also mean you will have to store inventory. If you look at how do you optimize your supply chain, on one axis, there could be capacity, on the other axis, there could be inventory. And on the third axis, there could be information. If you have information closest to the consumer, then you could optimize on the other two axes. You need lesser inventory and lesser capacity, and you could still ensure a very high rate of fulfillment. Right, right. So there's real time information flowing to the factories. That means oh, yeah. we now we get daily information and for a company which reaches nine out of 10 households in the country, about 95 percent of the households. And just think of it, we have got thousands of SKU, millions of stores reaching 95 percent. The quantum of information we have is massive. In the past, we used to say that the two biggest assets we have are a people and a brands. That's still very relevant because great people make great brands. But now we have added data to it. So it's right. people, brands and data. That's what will define HUL of the future. Very interesting. Yeah. Uh, uh, this um, we had we had this question on you know, Ramdev of Baba Ramdev of Patanjali saying is going to be the largest FFCG player of it. So, does he anyway look like dethroning HUL anytime in the future? Okay. First, let me give you my philosophy. <laughs> it's, uh, we respect all our competitors. We do a lot of research on our competitors. Many times I feel Vinay. We know more about our competitors than the competitors know about themselves. <laughs> themselves. Okay. But our obsession is with consumers, not with competitors. If we do the right thing for the consumers, they will award us with loyalty. Yeah. We have the best possible talent any consumer could come, or for that matter, any company can have in the With the right people, the right talent, the right brands, the right culture, the right purpose, I'm absolutely certain that the best of HUL is ahead of us. And uh, I am a great believer in the India story. I'm a great believer in the runway that exists for FMCG and therefore I'm very confident about the prospects of HUL in India. Now question, will anyone dethrone us? Let me be very categorical, not under my watch. 
<laughs> That's good to hear. Right. Okay. Uh, Prasad, how much time do we have? Or have we already overrun our time? We've overrun, but we can take one more question, yes. Sanjeev. Yeah. yeah. So, so what does what does Sanjeev Mehta do when he is not breathing and thinking about HUL? What so are you my, golf for? Or do you read? I, or? I, you know, I read a lot. I have a wonderful collection. I read all kind of genre books, from philosophical to management to autobiographies. There was a time when I used to also read a lot of fiction. I still love it, but because of paucity of time, there's a trade-off. Then you look at it, what will give you more value? I'm a sports enthusiast. Yeah, I used to play golf, and uh, but uh, now I've uh, kind of have got a hypersensitivity to scare, to sun, so I avoid golf, but uh, I'm a very big sports enthusiast, big supporter of the India team. Yeah, be it cricket or athletics or whatever, be it love cricket. Right, right now they're in the doghouse, but I know you know how things have changed within a few days, <laughs> and uh, that also really boils down to is uh, always be grounded. Yeah, never be complacent, and uh, you know all your competitors is respect them. So I hope things turn around again. We still have two more tests. It okay. will be fight against the ball to save this test. Unless right. rain God helps us, it seems like a very different, difficult position to be in. Absolutely. But the team like they did in Australia, they bounce back again. Yeah, amazing. Absolutely. One has to accept that this is a great team, even if we lose this test. I think our faith in the team should not go away. We should still back them up. And they have demonstrated time and again their resilience and their ability to come back. To come back, yeah. yeah. They will come back. And I would like to see that even Virat Kohli regaining his form. Mm. Yeah, that's a big one. Yeah. Because. They're not crucial for the team. Yeah, yeah that oft repeated statement. That form is temporary, but class is permanent. Class is permanent, yeah. Actually has class. So it will be difficult to keep him down for long. Right. right. Sanjeev, uh, I'm sorry, can I just squeeze in one more question? I just wanted to get your thoughts on the overall, you know, economic, uh, 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 you know, roadmap for India. And, you know, people are talking about, uh, do we need some intervention to drive consumption? Because as of now, a lot of uh, supply, on the supply side we're addressing, but uh, you know, right. maybe, yeah, so your thoughts. You know, first is the government has done a very good job when it comes to rural consumers, rural poor, with all the interventions of direct transfer of money, free food grains, enhancing the outlay on Manrega, MSP increase. And that has also resulted in rural being more resilient. Over the right. last few quarters, also the disruption has been more in urban than in rural. And not much has been done for the urban poor. Right. So you're absolutely right. The government has done a lot on the supply side. On the demand side, it's also not very easy. Because if you give direct intervention, the risk is always that people will save money rather than spending money. Right, right. So it's not very easy. But I think one of the things the government should definitely do is have an ability, now that you have biometrics, Aadhaar, etc., to identify the urban poor. So just like there are interventions for rural poor, there could be for urban poor. As far as the demand is concerned, I think the government should keep a very close watch because we are a consumption driven economy. Right now, it is difficult to fathom because of the base factors, etc., and the interruptions that have happened. But the next two, three months are going to be very critical for the economy. And if we can prevent the third wave, yes. then we will get a good appreciation of the underlying demand unfettered by the base. Right, right. That would be a good indication whether further intervention is required or the economy has started building momentum. 